So indeed, today's event is to uh, look at the revision of the eco-design regulation and how the agricultural biomass, so agrobiomass, fits in this context and which can be the challenges and opportunities for this sector. So today, you'll see we have a set of uh, uh, excellent speakers. We will have a first an overview on the eco-design process and the revision by the European Commission. We will then dig into the um, results of the project, so of AgroBioHeat, and the recommendations that the project have done uh, regarding the eco-design regulation and the possible inclusion on non-woody biomass in its scope. And then we will go to the roundtable discussion where we will have experts from the industry that will give us their perspective and their experience and discuss together with you which are indeed the challenges and opportunities ahead. So uh, which barriers are on field, how policies can help to overcome them and what we should expect for the future. So uh, before uh, getting to give the floor to the first speaker, I would like to uh, see a bit who is connected with us today. And that's why we have the first poll for our event. So uh, I, I would be interested to know which type of organization or company do you represent, if you, have a, you are a biomass boiler manufacturer or an association or a possible future end user or a public authority or policymaker. So don't be shy. I see some of the answer are popping in. And we also have a second question for you. Uh, which is more specifically on agricultural biomass or agrobiomass. So how significant is agrobiomass in your everyday business and activities? Okay, I see we have already a few answers popping in, but I will leave the poll open for another few seconds. So don't be shy. Okay, I think... Uh, no, I'm sorry, we don't have translation. We just received <laughs> an answer on this. The webinar will be in English, but the slides and the recording will also be available afterwards for your further knowledge. Okay, I think we can close the poll and show the results. So I see we have a different set of actors today. We have associations, but also consultancy or research and academia representative, a few manufacturer, which is also very interesting and producers as well. So really looking forward your questions for the roundtable discussion and i see that most for most of you of course agrobiomass is quite significant in your everyday business and some of you are not yet there but they will be would like to know more about this so i'm happy to tell you this is the right place to be and i think the next couple of hours would be really interesting for you and for your knowledge afterwards so uh, before giving the floor to uh, Bernardo Martinez from the commission, I would like to say a couple of words about Bioenergy Europe, as you might not be familiar with this association. We are the European Bioenergy Association. We are based in Brussels, and we do advocate for a better policy framework for all types of biomass. So woody biomass, agricultural biomass, use of residues in all different types of installations. Uh, nowadays, we have almost 190 members associated. Most of them are companies, as you can see here, but companies grow from really small businesses, family-owned ones, to bigger corporates. We do also have national associations active in several European member states, and we do have also academia and university representatives. Just for your information, we have a few uh, internal working groups dedicated to the different topics, and uh, one in particular is uh, dealing with agrobiomass, the next meeting will be most likely in the second half of the year, but in case you're interested to know more, uh, please feel free to reach out and uh, we will be happy to have you there or to give you more information about this. But speaking about the AgroBioHeat project, since today's event is organized by the consortium, indeed, and led by Bioenergy Europe, the AgroBioHeat project is a European founded project which aims at promoting rural development and use of agricultural biomass for heating for renewable heating solutions. Uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was launched in January 2019 and it's getting to an end in June. Uh, I will tell you more about our final conference <laughs> in a second. And uh, indeed, the project coordinator is CERD, so we will have the uh, Manolis Carampini speaking right after and presenting the overview of the project. The goal of AgroBioEat is indeed to uh, raise awareness and to have like uh, promote best cases. Here is indeed the, the final conference that we are all seeing in a hybrid form in Brussels and online. And if you wish to register, you can simply scan the QR code here and you can find more information about the program and everything in the project website. But going back to the aim and the objective of AgroBioEat, I think first it's important to take one step back actually. 
and have a, a better idea of what we're talking about today. So if we look at agricultural biomass, there are several types of feedstocks. Uh, the first one is agricultural residues. So this can be either herbaceous or woody ones, or depending on the country and the situation can be straw, maize residues, prunings. And the good thing of this is that there is quite a large potential because for one ton of agricultural product, you can get one ton of residues and so renewable energy from there. The second type of feedstock is for agro-industrial residues. And here I'm thinking about um, olive stones or olive cakes or in the olive oil production, but can also be shells from nuts of different types, uh, husks from sunflower, for example, or other sort of uh, agro-industrial residues. And here the, ad the advantage is that you don't have, uh, you don't need to do harvesting because this is kind of the result of an industrial process. And they also have a very good calorific value. So in terms of fuel, they are quite competitive. And the last, but definitely not least, source of agricultural biomass comes from dedicated energy crops, like perennial energy crops, for example. And here again, uh, they can be both herbaceous and woody, or we can also have short rotation copies like poplar, willow, and so on. So usually these also have several advantages because they can be cultivated on abandoned or marginal land, or they can use also for fetal remediation on contaminated land. So they do have additional benefit than simply providing renewable energy. So this is to, to start with, let's say, but looking at the activities of the project, indeed, uh, we look at supporting initiatives at local level, so in different member states, promoting agrobiomass heating, but also uh, further give visibility to success stories and cases uh, for them to be replicated in other contexts. And on top of this, of course, we do have compliance with emission limits because that is a very important topic. And we are aware that agricultural biomass has different features than body biomass, for example. And also to look at the policy recommendation for upcoming uh, national or European legislation. And in particular, these two points, I would say the compliance and the policy recommendation fits quite well in today's topic because this uh, is also about the influence and the process on the co-design regulation revision. On top of this, we do have also communication and dissemination activities, but we do also have what is called the Agrobiomass Observatory, which I encourage you to go and check if you haven't done it yet. So basically here you can see a map listing the different uh, um, agrobiomass heating system, uh, different cases using power CSP or large scale heat, depending, I mean, you can filter it for the type of plant you want to see. And you can also put some additional filter for the country, the type of crops or the feedstock, let's say, if it's certified or not, and so on. And to give you a very simple example of how this works, as today we have Linka with us among the speaker, I thought it was nice to give you some visibility. You can click on the one of the plants in the map and you will get a focus on the company, where it's located, uh, which are the features, and you can get more and more information. So again, if you haven't done this yet, I would really encourage you to go and check the observatory to play a little bit with the numbers and the map to, and get to know more about uh, cases, maybe also in your country or, or region. And as I said before, we also have communication material because indeed one of the problems with agricultural biomass is that it's so, there's often a lack of knowledge and awareness on this topic. So within the project, we developed several guides. Here you can see a few on different topics. So one is the straw to energy guide, which is particularly relevant in Denmark, for example. We had the maize residue to, uh, to energy guide, which was done by our Ukrainian partner, uh, despite, I have to say, the current context and the difficult situation. They do are uh, very active and they're still very active on this topic. And other guides like the agro-industrial residues one or the prunings one, which will be published very soon. So having said that, and without further ado, I will now give the floor to uh, Bernardo Martinez from the European Commission. So Bernardo, you should have the control of the presentation and the floor is yours, if you can turn on your camera. Uh, well, good afternoon. I hope that you can hear me and, and also see me well. Uh, well, I would like to thank first uh, to the organizer, to everybody, to, for having invited the European Commission to give this uh, short presentation about the activities of the of PG Energy, the Directorate General for Energy, related to energy efficiency. Um, 
so yeah you can go to the next slide oh, uh, sorry i have the control i think if it works yes so when well we come to the legislation uh, on on energy efficiency we have to look at it from two sides uh, from the side of eco design and also from the side of energy labeling so basically what uh, we have and what we 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 carry out in the commission is, is legislation at both uh, levels so for instance if we have a, a product like for instance in the case of today solid fuel, solid fuel boiler or solid fuel local space heaters we develop separate regulations for eco design and energy labeling and what is uh, each of those uh, of these concepts so probably many of you are are very already familiar with it um, on eco design what we try to do is to set out minimum energy efficiency requirements so that the worst performing products are phased out in the case of uh, fuel uh, or fossil fuel heaters we don't only look at the energy efficiency but also at the pollutant emissions so we have both uh, sides the, the products that have to be or that can be placed on the market have to be at the same time energy efficiency but also have to respect a certain level uh, of emission of pollutant emission so the products in principle that do not fulfill these uh, minimum limits uh, cannot be put in the market cannot be placed in the market and they need to be phased out by a deadline which is set out in the legislation uh, this is with respect to eco design. With respect to energy labeling, what we try to do is to foster the energy efficiency of products so that they go from a lower range to a higher range in terms of uh, energy efficiency. So energy labeling, as you may very well know, uh, sets out um, a classification so that uh, the greener uh, parts of the scale they correspond to the best energy performing products and the lower parts of that scale correspond to the to the products that are less uh, energy efficient this is aimed at uh, well has in principle two main targets uh, the first one is to inform the consumer so that uh, when the consumer goes to a shop or uh, looks uh, for a product through the through the internet they can see uh, the energy efficiency of a product and they can already um, have an idea of how much is going to cost them in relative terms with other products to uh, run uh, or to operate with this uh, product but also it has uh, an aspect of incentive for the industry by having this uh, clear display this clear classification the uh, manufacturers will normally tend uh, to be reflected in the highest part of the scale so we think that it's uh, it's both and actually it's, it's a proof defect that energy labeling is not only good for or convenient for customer information but it, it also foster uh, the technical the technological development and the the, for, the the effort of the manufacturers in terms of uh, research and and development I will go to the next slide. Um, well, in terms of a scope, and then after giving this general idea, I could probably focus somehow on, on solid fuel boilers and solid fuel local space heaters. But in terms of a scope, um, eco design and energy labeling currently encompasses 50 implementing measures, so 50 regulations, which are uh, directly applicable. So for these regulations to apply, we don't need any kind of uh, transposition by member states. We just define them, they are adopted, and they apply directly to the member states. Um, we include in these uh, 50 implementing measures uh, the title leveling regulation, two voluntary agreements, 31 product groups, among them the solid fuel appliances, um, which accounts for 3 billion products in a scope sold in 2020, so quite a lot and also account for consumption which is equivalent to the 50 percent of the eu final energy this is in terms of a scope um no no
Okay. Now, in terms of impact, uh, in the in terms of emissions and 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 products affected. So um, the the information comes from a report that is issued annually by a, a, a consultant, which is called the uh, Eco Design Impact Accounting. And according to the 2020 figures of this uh, report. The impact of eco design energy labeling measures account for 10% of cut in the EU primary energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, which are associated to this um, energy use. Um, in terms of electricity savings, it accounts for 1000 kilowatt hour per household, uh, which is equivalent to the full. Uh, production of energy by wind power generation or hydropower generation in the EU, and the equivalent also to two to three times the uh, solar photovoltaic production. And in terms of uh, consumption, it affects uh, 60 billion, uh, it uh, leads to 60 billion euro of savings of the uh, annual consumer bill, which is equivalent to 210 euros per household. Well, the, the impact of the cost design measures increases over time. However, they tend to level off. And so we have estimated that after 2030, if we don't renew the legislation, if we don't review it and we come up with more uh, stringent and demanding requirements in general for all products, after uh, 2030, the savings will level off and we will not have savings uh, anymore. And this is why the Commission is engaged now uh, to a full revision of the existing eco design and energy labeling legislation uh, in order to uh, try to set out uh, new uh, requirements that lead to further uh, energy efficiency uh, or energy savings. And this also affects the uh, solid fuel local space heaters and the solid fuel local space, uh, sorry, uh, boilers uh, that uh, of which I will be talking right now. Now, in in let's say um, practical terms, I have to say that we are at the beginning of the review of the legislation uh, for for eco design of solid fuel local space heaters. We have now. A regulation in place, which is Regulation 2015/1185. This regulation sets limits for uh, particulate matters, uh, organic gas compounds, CO and NOx, and is applicable as from 1st of January 2022. And now we will be starting a process of revision of that legislation of this uh, regulation, which includes a back-to-back, -back, what we call a back-to-back -back evaluation and impact assessment. This means that we will be evaluating the current legislation to check it, its effectiveness and its efficiency, to see how effective it's been in uh, reducing the energy consumption and in reducing the emission of pollutants. And once that we have clear um, the effects of the legislation, will go to an impact assessment uh, which will explore uh, the options that we have in order to further improve the energy efficiency of uh, solid fuel local space heaters. Now, what aspects we'll be looking uh, at in this back-to-back -back evaluation and impact assessment? For instance, and that doesn't mean that we are necessarily going to make amendments to all these aspects, but indeed we need to assess them to know the current state of the play and to see what measures, if we can adopt measures, what measures can we adopt in order to improve the situation and to um, gain uh, further energy, energy savings and if possible to reduce further the emission of pollutants. So we will be looking at the scope, we will be looking at technologies available uh, in order to reduce emissions or to improve the energy efficiency. So we'll be looking at uh, best available technologies, but also best not available technologies. Um, we will be assessing uh, the current emission limits and the energy efficiency thresholds in order to see, uh, according to the state of the play of technology, if they can be further reduced. 
we may be looking at the possible inclusion of circular economy requirements, for instance, regarding reparability, rec recyclability. So these are issues that traditionally have not really been into, let's say, the scope of the, of the current uh, legislation. But uh, there is a willingness, a uh, general political objective, to try to bring uh, also circular economy aspects inside this uh, type of legislation. We also will also look at the possibility to include third party uh, certification that could replace uh, the self certification. And we will also be looking at the revision of, of existing standards to see if they can remain, if they really fulfill the uh, requirements and the demands of uh, co-design and uh, energy labeling legislation and to see if we can improve them somehow. Now, uh, regarding the revision itself, uh, as far as the timeline, as I have mentioned before, we haven't really started yet. Uh, so we, we go with a little bit of, of probably a little bit of delay, uh, but we expect to have the reports ready of both the evaluation and impact assessment by uh, mid or the end of next uh, year, assuming that we can start um, after uh, after the summer break of this year, more or less uh, around September. So it would take around one year uh, to carry out the, the report or the, the study and, and to draft the report. And then uh, we would need probably one more year for the adoption of the legislation on the basis of the um, conclusions that we get from the respective uh, reports. So this is regarding the co-design of solid fuel local space heaters. We have also the energy labeling part that I will try to display now. Yes, um, we have already started here the process of, of review the legislation. So regarding energy labeling, we are a little, a little bit more advanced than with um, with the co-design. So the current rules are set out in Regulation EU 2015-1186. The process is exactly the same for the revision of this piece of legislation. So we'll have uh, to carry out the back-to-back -back evaluation and impact assessment. Actually, the evaluation is ready. Um, and the aspects that are being or will be looked at in the impact assessment is the possible extension of the scope so we, that we can uh, perhaps include also electric heaters and electric heat pumps in the in the labeling. The possible revision of the biomass factor, which is currently as many of you know 1.45, and also the possible inclusion of a secondary scale in the label for air pollutants. So this doesn't really mean that we are going to do it. I know that some of these issues may be a little bit controversial. We may find different opinions in the sector, but uh, obviously uh, I would say we need to to have a look at them, we need to consider them, and we need to, to assess if they are correctly addressed in the legislation or not. As far as the, the timeline, as I already said, the, the evaluation has already been carried out, so it's uh, ready uh, from the end of 2021. And now we have to start with the process of the, of the impact assessment, starting by what we call a call for evidence, which is a call for opinion of the stakeholders. Uh, which uh, is supposed to be published now in, uh, in this month, um, and it, so that we give four weeks uh, to the stakeholders so that they can they can uh, provide their their input. It's uh, a consultation which is completely public and with free access, uh, so there is no problem to provide the the opinion. There will be also what we call a public consultation. Uh, which is uh, 12 weeks. So the difference between the call for evidence and the public consultation is that the call for evidence is a little bit more technical. It's focusing on more technical aspects and the public consultation is, is uh, really addressed to the general public. So it's uh, um, perhaps more simpler questions, more general. So to know, for instance, how uh, the consumer perceives the, the energy label, uh, it's more focused from a, uh, from a consumer perspective, while the call for evidence is more intended for real stakeholders, for, for industry and relevant players like associations, etc. And um, regarding the adoption in, in itself of the revised legislation, so we expect 
that it could be already adopted by the end uh, of Q3 2023. And the final slide is dedicated to the solid fuel boilers, but actually the process is exactly the same as for eco design uh, from solid fuel local space heaters that I have been already explained. So we have uh, the current rules, one for eco design and energy labeling. So both from 2015, uh, we have 1189 and 1187 respectively for, for eco design and energy labeling. And the process is exactly the same. We haven't started yet. So the, the status is exactly the same as for eco design from a local solid fuel local space heaters. We carry out a, a joint back-to-back -back evaluation and impact assessment. Uh, we will begin, it, it's written there, March 2022. We haven't started yet, so it will be rather by September of this year. And the indicative the, uh, timeline is basically the same. So by, uh, by, by mid next year, we have the evaluation and the impact assessment reports ready and the uh, we expect the adoption of the revised legislation to be possible by one year later. So back to you, René. Thank you so much, Bernardo. And uh, indeed, thank you for uh, giving, it, giving us an update on the timeline, next steps, and also for flagging the call for evidence in the public consultations is indeed something we will uh, follow and be ready to react as soon as it's published, which should be anytime soon from what you said. I see there is a question in the um, in the Q and A box, which is saying, "Are you considering to add a criteria on renewability in the revision? So for biomass uh, is renewable, while electricity for each pump is using the electricity mix, which can be only in part renewable. So do you consider the factor of being a renewable source to be to have an impact in the revision, or or not?" I think it's a little bit early to say, but um, we we can assess it. Uh, in the, when when we when we start the, the evaluation, we'll be looking at different aspects that need to be taken into account for the development of the future policy options. And well, I, I have to be honest; I hadn't been thinking about that yet. But of course, uh, well, we are here to to listen also, and if. if stakeholders consider some aspects that may be relevant that we will need to assess in the legislation i will be happy to take note of that and and, and incorporate it to the to the study if we think that it makes uh, sense and that it can be valid for for the outcome of the, of the report of the study absolutely bernardo thanks uh, thanks for reminding this and of course we are glad to bring you feedback from the industry that's indeed why we're having a conversation today and why it's relevant also and we're really happy to have you here today with us. I don't see further question at this stage, but we will have more questions afterwards in the roundtable discussion. Uh, now, before going into the details of the project result and look at the um, lab test results, I would like to give back the floor to Manolis, which is the project coordinator indeed, uh, to give an overview more targeted to the role of agrobiomass within the eco-design regulation. Because from Bernardo, we heard a bit of general terms, how the process is going and what this regulation and the directives are about. But please, Manolis, if you want, the floor is yours so that you can dig more into the detail of the relevance for the sector. Yeah, thank you, Anna, for the introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Indeed, I will be speaking a bit uh, and go a little deeper in how uh, agrobiomass or non-woody biomass, as is the more technical term, uh, is integrated currently in the eco-design regulation and perhaps what could be the future uh, direction. So just to recap, uh, the relevant regulation we are talking about is 2015-1189. Uh, it's the, how eco design is implemented for solid fuel boilers. And it covers capacities all the way up to 500 kilowatts, which is, I would say, um, let's say installation suitable also for the residential sector and uh, some commercial uh, examples. Uh, the regulation is compulsory to be fulfilled from the 1st of January 2020 for new boilers sold in the market. It doesn't affect existing installations. Uh, 
And at the moment, it is only applicable for woody biomass boilers. Non-woody biomass is out of scope, and I will come back to this point in a couple of slides. And below on the table, you can see the current requirements for the seasonal space heating efficiency and emissions. Uh, the term seasonal space heating uh, efficiency and emissions is essentially a weighted average between the performance of the boiler in full load and uh, a partial load with a greater weight being given on the partial load. And uh, yeah, below you can see what is the current, let's say, uh, limits that the uh, devices have to fulfill. Uh, and also the regulation has uh, a benchmark for the best available techniques, which is actually quite lower than the limits, but with a note that there is no single uh, solid fuel boiler that can meet all the benchmark values. Uh, it might be possible that one or two models might be having uh, compliance with more than one. Uh, moving on. To the definitions, uh, well, the definition for what biomass is is pretty much standard and in line with other uh, regulations and directive from the European Union. Uh, woody biomass is essentially anything uh, of a woody nature coming from trees, bushes, or shrubs in whatever form. Uh, it can be pellets, it can be uh, briquettes, it can be sawdust uh, or uh, wood chips. And non woody biomass is essentially anything else. Uh, it includes fractions as well varied such as straw, miscanthus, reeds, uh, olive stones, uh, olive cake, nut cells, and anything else. And uh, already here, I would say, we see an issue about the, um, uh, the term agrobiomass, because in fact, we do have woody biomass fractions, which are non-forest or for in origin, such as uh, orchard prunings, prunings from olive trees, from vineyards, from other fruit trees. And often these fractions have different properties, such as higher ash content, a higher nitrogen content than the graded um, wood pellets, uh, the graded wood briquettes, or the graded wood chips uh, of forest origin, which are considered in the ISO standards. Uh, I mentioned before that non woody biomass was not uh, included in the scope of the eco design regulation back in 2015. And uh, the regulation it itself is uh, justifying why this was so. Basically, the reason was that at the, at the time there was insufficient uh, European wide information about the appropriate. Uh, eco design requirements. So what could be the efficiency and emission limits that such boilers could achieve? There was also another issue that was raised that it was the possibility that such devices, the fear that such devices could have additional significant environmental impacts, explicitly uh, emissions of furans and dioxides. So uh, what the regulation said that these uh, issues would be reevaluated and reassessed in the future, during a revision a review of this regulation, which is covered in Article 7. So in Article 7, uh, you can see uh, four items that were supposed to be covered. Uh, one is about the non-woody biomass boilers. Another, it's about the possible extension of this regulation up to 1,000 kilowatts, essentially covering the gap between eco-design and the medium combustion plant directives. And of course, uh, there is always, um, uh, let's say, a continued process of setting stricter emission limits, uh, as well as verifying uh, tolerances and so on. But as we heard from Bernardo, this process has uh, already exhibited some delays compared to what was initially uh, foreseen. Uh, beyond uh, eco design uh, and that facilities of a higher capacity, so above one megawatt and up to 50 megawatts, we have the medium combustion plant directive. Uh, the medium combustion plant directive regulates uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and dust. It doesn't regulate uh, carbon monoxide or OGCs. And below, you can see the emission limits that apply for existing and new plants. Uh, depending on their capacity. Thomas will be covering uh, those in a bit more detail in his presentation. So um, what was the agrobioheat approach regarding the eco-design review? 
Uh, some years ago, when we applied and successfully got funding for the project, we made an argument regarding how agrobiomass or non-woody biomass, whatever you prefer to call it, should be integrated in the uh, revised eco-design regulation. And basically, we saw three different paths ahead of us. Uh, the first option was that non-woody biomass would continue to be out of scope of the regulation, uh, which is the business as usual scenario. Uh, however, we saw that as very problematic because we already know that there is a very heavy discussion regarding air quality issues across Europe. And uh, if there is a fear by, I would say, national or regional legislators uh, about emissions from agrobiomass appliances, then they may be prompted to take action unilaterally on a, let's say, regional or national level. And then the, the results of this action may not be uh, appropriate. We have seen examples in the past, for example, in northern Italy, where even the sales of A2 quality pellets was banned because the regulators were fearing that they were contributing to air emission uh, issues. The second option, which is also not very good for the sector of development, was that uh, the non-woody biomass could be included in eco-design, but the emission limits could be very strict and totally unrealistic. Essentially, this means that no appliances could meet those limits, and then the market is effectively killed. It would be impossible to install or acquire um, new bagger biomass boilers, or they would require very, very expensive air emission control measures, which would make it, again, uneconomical. Uh, and obviously, uh, back some years ago, we were not aware of the, what would happen in, uh, in Ukraine and about the energy crisis that is now unfolding before our eyes. But now, at a time where I would say every renewable kilowatt hour that you can put on the market uh, really counts, uh, it is also important to foster the sustainable development of this market and support uh, really, let's say, uh, appropriate uh, devices and appliances when possible. So the third option, which was the logical one for us, was to support uh, the inclusion of more woody biomass uh, or agrobiomass boilers in eco design, but uh, adopting informed emission limits. What does an informed emission limit mean? It's a limit that can be met with modern installations and appropriate fuels. Essentially, we advocate for following the similar approach that was done for woody biomass boilers some years ago. Uh, and this way, as I said before, it would really support the development of the sector in a sustainable way and continue to contribute the decarbonization of the rural heating sector, where most of the agrobiomass potential anyway is. And how is the, it possible to adopt informed emission limits? Essentially through testing. So our uh, purpose in the project was to generate evidence from extensive uh, lab scale tests, following, of course, the EN standard that applies, using modern appliances, a wide range of agrobiomass fuels, and see what results we cannot see from them and how they compare with the current eco-design limits. And essentially, this is what you will hear from Thomas' presentation now on what we did in the project and what results we could. And based on that, I will come back later to present uh, our uh, recommendations about how non-woody biomass boilers can be integrated in eco-design. So I think that's all from my side for now. Thank you, Manalis, and uh, thanks indeed for going more into the details of the implications from uh, the agrobiomass uh, or non-body biomass, as you more correctly said, for uh, eco-design revision. I will now like to give the floor to Thomas indeed to get into the details of uh, another set of information, which is the result of the test, lab, the test that we did within the project. So Thomas, I think you should have the control of the presentation. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. My name is Thomas Brunner. I work for BIOS Bioenergy System in Graz, Austria, and within the AgroBioHeat project, we have been responsible for all these tasks related to boiler testing. And that's what this presentation is about, mainly about test runs with residential small scale boilers. So I do not have the control now, I think. I yes you are ah now i have it okay <laughs> uh, 
So therefore, I will talk now about the objectives of our testing campaigns. Uh, I want to talk also about some relevant aspects which are associated with agrobiomass combustion in general. I will talk about the methodology we applied. I will introduce the boiler we tested and also the fuels. And then I will come to the results of the test chance performed and some summary and conclusions. Uh, the test runs have been performed within task 4.2 of the AgroBio heat project and uh, the objective was to investigate the emissions and efficiencies of selected small-scale agrobiomass heating systems within tests and tests and of course this should be the basis for these discussions regarding the eco-design regulation as Manolis mentioned before. Uh, why? are uh, agrobiomass fuels so different from woody biomass fuels. Uh, you all know that they contain typically higher ash content and contents of some other critical elements. For instance, nitrogen. This leads to elevated NOx emissions. In eco-design for wood fuels, we have a NOx emission limit of 200 milligrams per cubic meters. Uh, and in the medium uh, combustion plants directive in the MCP for the larger plants, there's a higher limit value. If we recalculate it also to 10 volume percent oxygen, it's 480 milligrams for existing plants and 370 milligrams per cubic meter for new plants. And as you will see later on, the nitrogen content of the fuel is a very impact, uh, important factor, which has an impact on the NOx emissions uh, of combustion plants. Secondly, there is also usually an elevated sulfur content, which means also that we have higher SOX emissions. Well, EcoDesign doesn't limit SOX emissions, but there's a limit in the MCP directive. Uh, but I can tell you from our test trends that uh, during the tests, we had no problems to keep us with the agrobiomass as we tested these limit values of the MCP directive. Uh, however, of course, sulfur also means a certain risk for low temperature corrosion, which has to be considered by the boiler manufacturers. Regarding chlorine, uh, of course, there could be a risk of elevated HCL emissions, but there are no emission limits defined so far. Uh, but there's also a risk for elevated dioxin and furan emissions. Here we have no limit value in the eco design regulation. But for instance, in Germany, in the first beam shower, there is already a limit of 0 0.1 nanogram per cubic meter for agricultural fuels mentioned. And therefore, we also had a look at dioxide emissions during our project. Of course, chlorine again means uh, that there is a certain risk for corrosion issues associated to this element. Ash content. Compared with wood fuels, we have significantly higher ash contents. That means higher deposit formation on boiler tubes, which could reduce efficiency, could make more boiler cleaning efforts needed. But also, this could mean elevated fly ash emissions and also elevated risks for slagging and ash agglomeration uh, on the grates and in the furnaces. And this, in turn, can also lead to some operational problems and also increase carbon monoxide and OGC emissions. Of special interest in the ash are silicon and potassium, because potassium is mainly responsible for the formation of fine particulate matter emissions, and uh, both in combination can lead to reduced ash melting temperatures, which can lead to slagging problems. So this has to be kept in mind when looking at agrobiomass combustion in general. Let's have a look at the methodology we applied. Our general approach was that we wanted to test different systems at uh, three project partners. We selected state-of-the-art wood pellet and wood chip boilers. And some of these boilers are already commissioned also for the utilization of selected agrofuels. At each boiler, different agrofuels have been tested, which one I'll show you later on. We perform test runs at full and at 30% partial load. And we looked at the operation stability, at efficiencies, emissions, and here main focus, of course, on CO, OGC, NOx, HCL, and SOX emissions, and of course, on particulate matter. 
where it was possible, we followed the methodology of boiler testing, which is defined in the EN 303-5. And additionally, we also added flue gas cleaning devices like uh, electrostatic precipitators to the systems. So we had a typical test run set up like that, where we have the boiler, and then we have a measurement section where we do all these measurements uh, I mentioned before. And uh, this looked like that, for instance, in uh, the lab at third in Greece, where you see the boiler, where you see the ESB and the sampling sections and the measurement devices here. What measurement and sampling did we do? There were some discontinuous sampling and measurements, of course, fuel sampling, grade ash and filter ash sampling, and this was followed by chemical analysis of the samples. We took uh, TSP samples and also analyzed them. We looked at HCL and SOX emissions, and during the selected test runs, also dioxin and furans were investigated. Continuously, we measured the heat output, the flue gas temperatures, and of course, the emissions of CO, NOx, and OGC in the flue gas. So that's now a little bit the background regarding the methods we applied. And let's look at the boiler we tested. In total, there have been six boilers tested. You see they have been in a capacity range between 20 kilowatt and 135 kilowatts. Boiler one was based on an extremely staged uh, fixed bed combustion technology. It was operated without any ESP. And here you see a list of fuels we tested at this spoiler. It was a short rotation carpet chips from Bobler, sunflower husk pellets, aqua pellets, and maize cups. Boiler two was a moving grade boiler, 50 kilowatts. It was equipped with an uh, additional electrostatic precipitator. And uh, maize residues, miscanthus, and olive stones were tested. Boiler three, four and five were also boilers uh, based on moving grades and boiler six was move, uh, based on the sliding grade. You see the different capacity ranges. And again, we have a nice mixture of olive stones, sunflower husk uh, pellets, wheat straw pellets, miscanthus, almond shells, vineyard prunings. So you see a very broad range of different biomass fuels we applied in these boilers. Some photos from the different fuels. Sunflower husk pellets tested at three boilers. Olive stones, you see a rather small particle size compared to the sunflower husks tested at four boilers. Miscanthus, chopped miscanthus tested at two boilers. Almond shells were also tested at two boilers. And poplar chips and aqua pellets at one specific boiler, maize cups at two boilers, and olive tree prunings also at one boiler. Uh, agro pellets, in this respect, we mean uh, pellets made from some residues, and they have been mixed with some inorganic additives in order to uh, increase the ash melting temperatures and make them more suitable for uh, combustion. So this is a commercial product. Uh, then we also had vineyard pruning pellets and wheat straw pellets tested at one boiler each. In this table, you see a summary of relevant fuel parameters compared with parameters for softwood and class A1 wood pellets. And what you can see uh, if we look at the ash content, only olive stones are somewhere in the range of wood chips or wood pellets. All the other agrobiomass fuels we tested have significantly higher ash contents, uh, especially the agro pellets, the wheat straw pellets, and the olive tree pruning pellets have uh, very high ash contents. If you look at the nitrogen, again, olive stones are close to the values of uh, woody biomass. And uh, I just tried to activate the laser pointer. Yep. So now it's achieved. Okay. And you see very high nitrogen contents, for instance, for the sunflower husk pellets here, and uh, also for the olive tree pruning pellets. All in all, you see that the nitrogen content of the agrobiomass assortments is 
in most times significantly higher than the one of the softwood pellets or the softwood chips. Also for sulfur, we see some fuels like sunflower husk pellets, agro pellets, or wheat straw, and also the pruning uh, fractions, which show elevated sulfur contents and chlorine is especially high for miscanthus, straw, maize cups, and also for this sunflower husk assortments here. Very important regarding particulate matter emissions is the potassium content. And here you can see that only olive stones can somehow, let's say, compete with softwood and class uh, A1 softwood pellets. All the other fuels show very high potassium contents, which means that uh, we also have to expect rather high particulate emissions, especially fine particulate emissions. And uh, I want to point out this maize cup assortment here with 10,000 milligrams per kilogram potassium and almost 3,000 milligram per kilogram chlorine. This is a uh, fuel which is uh, not really suitable for combustion in residential scale because uh, with this composition, it has a potential for very, very high PM uh, emissions. And uh, that's what we also saw during the test run. So, uh, but we compared the composition of uh, these maize cups with database values and saw that uh, this is a little bit an outlier. So therefore, we do not consider this assortment during the evaluation of results in the following. Yeah, let's come to the results of our test runs. Uh, first important thing to tell is that we saw with all the plants, no major problems regarding the general operation and functionality uh, of the plants. So fuel feeding worked well, the ashing worked well. We had no problems with, with ash melting and uh, slagging in the plant. Yeah, uh, that's, I think, uh, a very important issue because uh, later for a residential use of these fuels, it's important that uh, the plants run without major problems in the fuel feeding and the ashing system, which uh, also could cause efforts from the plant operator. Uh, on the next slides, you see the results uh, of the different emission parameters. You will see the results for full load, partial load at 30%, and then seasonal emissions according to EcoDesign. Here we have an 85% weighing of the partial load emissions over 15% uh, of the full load emissions. Please keep that in mind. And all emissions you see will be related to dry flugas and 10 volume percent oxygen. Let's start with the CO emissions of the different boilers. It's uh, arranged in a way that we put here together all these different fuel assortments, tested the different boilers. And here on top, you see more these assortments, which have uh, only be, been tested at uh, one specific boiler. And uh, for comparison, we introduced the limit value according to the echo design regulation. And uh, what we can see here is that uh, for some boilers and some fuels, we had no problems to keep the CO emission limits. Uh, also with this agricultural fuels compared to the uh, emission limit of the eco design for wood fuels. We see some other boilers where we have no problems to keep at full load the uh, emission limits, like you see it here for the wheat straw in boiler four, also for the vineyard prunings in boiler five and so on. But uh, with these boilers, we saw that especially during partial load, there has been a problem to keep the emission limit and therefore the seasonal emissions also exceed the eco design limit value for wood fuels. However, if uh, fuel doesn't work so well at partial load, this simply means that uh, some adaptations of the boiler, of the air staging setting, of the control settings might improve the situation so that also with uh, these boilers four, five, and six, the emission limits could be kept or the emission limit for CO could be kept. <clears throat> Only for the boiler number three, we see always uh, emissions above the uh, limit value. So here, some major revisions would be needed to make it suitable for keeping this uh, emission limit value. 
Next, uh, NOx emissions. And here we see, oh, sorry, that was too fast. Next, NOx emissions. And here we see that with, yeah, with olive stones, it has been possible to keep the NOx emission limit as it's stated for wood fuels in the Equidesign regulation. For all other fuels, we partly significantly exceed the NOx emission limit value. Uh, I, will, I will show you later on uh, another slide uh, which will explain why this happens. So now continue with the TSB emissions. Here we added some information if an ESP was operated or not at this specific test run. And we can see that uh, with this boiler one, even without applying an ESP, we can, without a uh, problem, keep the particulate matter emissions, uh, emission limit values uh, of EcoDesign. We see that without ESP, it makes for boiler six no sense to operate uh, the plant because of the high PM emissions. We see that other boilers, like for instance, boiler four or boiler two with the ESPs which have been installed there are able to keep the emission limit. And there are some other boilers like uh, boiler five, for instance, where we are not able to come below this 40 milligrams per cubic meter. So that also shows that the uh, it's important that the ESP, which is used in such a system, is really tailored to the demands of acrobiomas combustion. That means that uh, you cannot uh, simply take a ESP, which is designed for wood fuels and apply it in an agrobiomas combustion plant. Uh, the filter surfaces, the cleaning strategy should be carefully adapted for the higher particulate matter contents, which are to be expected from combustion of agrobiomass fuels. So if we sum that up, first important thing, as I saw in, uh, told you in the beginning, was that we had no significant performance problems, even if regarding the emissions, we saw some significant differences. All the plants had no problems with fuel feeding and the ashing, no problems with ash melting. However, if we look at the bulk density of the fuels, uh, we saw that uh, there is a little bit of varying power output compared to wood chips and wood pellets, uh, depending, of course, on the bulk density of the fuel. With lower bulk density, you cannot make so much heat like with fuels with higher bulk densities. Regarding the CO emissions, we saw that boiler one and two and boiler five for the almond shells uh, were able to keep the CO and also the OGC emission limits for the wood fuels without any need for adaptations and optimizations. For boilers four, five, and six, we saw that the emission limits were exceeded for the CO, but uh, for the full load, the plants operated well. Uh, the problem was in the partial load operation. And this means that with uh, some optimization on air staging and process control, it's uh, possible to keep also for these plants the CO emissions below the emission limit value. Only for boiler three, we saw that the uh, emissions were too high. And for this technology, we had to find the conclusion that there are some really major revisions needed to operate it uh, successfully with agrobiomass fuels. Back to the NOx. What you see here on this slide is the nitrogen content in the fuel. And here the NOx emissions. Uh, these data are taken from full load operation. In blue, you have the test runs within our project. And in black, these are database values from other projects which we have uh, available here at BIOS. And here in red, red you see the echo design uh, emission limit for the wood fuels. And here you see the emission limit from the MCP directive. And what we see here is that with increasing nitrogen content, also the NOx emissions increase. We have two outlayers here with boiler three. We would have expected somewhat 
lower emissions and also here with boiler five we would have expected somewhat lower emissions but what we see is that the major parts of the fuels we tested is uh, in a range which would be acceptable for instance for the mcb uh, directive limit value so that's uh, what's written on this next slide so we can skip that yeah regarding pm emissions uh, we saw you remember the slide in the beginning that most of the fuels we tested really have high ash and especially potassium contents and this leads uh, to increased inorgan inorganic particulate emissions therefore you should use an esp only boiler one with its uh, low pm emission combustion technology could keep the emission limit without any need for an esp but what we also saw is that not uh, all ESP models are really suitable for the PM separation in uh, uh, during agrobiomass combustion, because you have to consider that most of them have been developed for wood combustion, and therefore uh, you have to correctly consider the high particle load and also the chemical composition of uh, the particles generated during agrobiomass combustion and you have to adapt voltage current and also the, the frequency of uh, filter cleaning to the demands of these particular matter emissions but uh, as you also saw from our tests uh, some filters made it and therefore it's possible to adapt these parameters uh, accordingly uh, another thing uh, would like to point out that uh, besides this inorganic particulate matter emissions we also see organic particulate matter and soot emissions which are usually a result of a bad gas phase burnout however as soon as a combustion unit uh, is capable to keep the low co and ogc emission limits as they are prescribed by ecodesign for instance these soot particles will not be of relevance anymore so the precipitation problem is mainly on the inorganic particles which are produced during combustion some other aspects uh, one of them has not been mentioned in the slides before. We also investigated boiler efficiencies and they were quite well comparable with those uh, which the same plants could achieve uh, during combustion of wood fuels. And uh, then during the test runs with uh, Ms. Cantos at boiler two, we also did some dioxane and furan analysis. And our result was that uh, the emissions were in a range between 0.004 and 0.007 nanograms per cubic meter. Uh, for comparison, the German limit value is 0.1 nanograms per cubic meter. I have to tell that Boiler 2 operated very well regarding CO and OGC emissions, so there was a very good gas phase burnout. It could be that at plants with a Worse gas phase burnout, uh, dioxane and furan emissions become a topic, but as soon as a plant is able to keep the low emission limits as prescribed again by, for instance, eco design, there should be no major issue uh, for this miscantus at least uh, with uh, dioxane and furan emissions. Yeah, if we sum it up, then we can tell that there are are boilers on the market which during operation with agrobiofuels can keep the CO, OGC and PM emission limits for wood fuels of the current eco design regulation. Uh, we saw that some of the boilers have elevated emissions during partial load operation. However, I think this can be overcome by minor adaptation of the boilers and of the process control system. Regarding NOx, we clearly see the trend that with increasing nitrogen content of the fuel, also the NOx emissions increase. This is a well-known effect. And uh, we think that the approach, which uh, is in the latest version of the EN303-5, 
by recalculating NOx emissions based on the fuel nitrogen content and stating the recalculated value in the test report, that this is a, also a meaningful option for agrobiomass fuel combustion. And regarding the PM emissions, uh, which is, of course, a very important topic regarding air quality issues, we see that either a novel low PM emission combustion technology like of Boiler One can keep the emission limits or otherwise application of correctly dimensioned ESBs, which are really tailored to the demands of agrobiomass combustion, can help to keep also the very low emission limit, uh, as it's stated for wood fuels, for instance, in the eco design regulations. So this have now been uh, the most important results of our test runs. And I would like to hand over again to Manolis, I think. Yes, thank you, Thomas, uh, for the great presentation on the results we achieved in the project. Uh, I don't know if I have control of it, Irene, yet. Uh, no, but uh, wait, uh, uh, we have something before uh, Manolis. Because ah, yes, yes, thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you, Thomas, for the presentation and for uh, giving us an update on the main result of the project. I would like to ask you another question to our attendees. Uh, also to check a little bit the polls of the, of the room. So I will launch another poll now. And my first question is indeed if the eco-design regulation, so the one on solid biomass fuels, have a direct impact on your business or a direct effect on your everyday business. And the second question, before disclosing the result of the recommendation of the project, if you support uh, the, in principle, the idea of adopting the same emission limits for non-woody biomass or agrobiomass within the eco-design directive. So I see our audience is voting. A few, a few answers are coming in. So I will suggest waiting another few seconds just to let most of the attendees made up their mind. And then we will disclose the result of the poll before getting to the recommendation from Agrovaluate project. Okay, I see that more than half of the participants voted. So I will say we'll wait two seconds and we can now close the poll and show the results. So I think for a uh, majority of the attendees, eco-design has an impact. Uh, for some of them, uh, it's still quite a marginal issues and some of them don't, uh, it's not an issue at all. But still, if we look at the percentages, more than half of the attendees have to a certain extent uh, an impact from eco-design. And I think the answer on the second question is also a bit, uh, uh, it's a bit, uh, I mean, we have different opinions. So you can see most is yes, they agree on having in principle the same limit, but some still didn't make up their mind. So maybe Manolis, uh, you can go ahead with the uh, results of the, like the recommendation of the project. And uh, I will give you the control of the PowerPoint. And then we can address questions that were raised to Thomas before going to the round table. Seem to move the presentation though, however. Okay, maybe, oops. I think we might have had some technical issues, but I will get back the presentation for you, Manolis, just one second. Please, Manolis, you can go ahead with the. Yeah, uh, please, we can change the to go to the next slide if you uh, cannot do it myself. Okay, great. So, before I give the recommendations in a very condensed uh, form, uh, I would just like to point out a couple of uh, disclaimers uh, first. Uh, the, the first is the standard disclaimer, disclaimer that we have in any kind of project deliverable or output is that uh, these are opinions expressed by the project and its partners, but they do not necessarily reflect those of the European Commission or its services. Uh, 
the second disclaimer or clarification is that uh, AgroBioHeat is not drafting the new eco design regulation. We try, as I said, to influence the process by submitting informed recommendations, but it's not ultimately up to us to, um, to draft the, the final document. And the last uh, is that, of course, your feedback is very much welcome. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have received uh, through contacts with uh, technology providers uh, some very interesting suggestions. Uh, but of course, note that it should be justified. And obviously, it is not the only factor that is influencing the project recommendations. So having said this, I think I can present uh, what would be or what we expect to be unless we hear something very extraordinary from you. Uh, our recommendations. So, next one. Perfect. So, uh, the I have presented everything here in a tabularized form, and I think in the first uh, question, whether eco design should be extended to non-woody biomass fuels, of course, our reply here is yes, and I'm happy to see that most of the participants today seem to suggest with uh, this. So, if you agree with this, sorry. Uh, when it comes to introduction of emission limits for carbon monoxides and organic gaseous compounds, I think that the results that Thomas uh, presented suggest that it is possible to adopt at least the current emission limits that apply for woody biomass fuels. So 500 milligrams per normal cubic meter of seasonal emissions for carbon monoxide and 20 milligrams per normal cubic meter for organic gaseous compounds. When it comes to NOx emissions, uh, I think it was clear that the NOx emissions from non-woody biomass combustion are higher in general than woody biomass fractions, at least the forest ones. But uh, this is a fuel-related issue primarily and not an appliance-related issue. Uh, and in that sense, uh, we don't think that it is proper that eco-design regulates uh, fuel since it applies only to appliances. Uh, so our, again, our approach is to follow what is already included in the EN 303-5 standard, which is to state emission limits for a solid biomass boiler at a reference fuel nitrogen level. I think the example at the standard is 0.08%, a drive base of nitrogen content. And then uh, the measured NOx emissions with agrobiomass should be recalculated using the formula included in the standard. When it comes to particle matter emissions, uh, our suggestion, again, based on the results of the agrobioheat project, is that the current emission limits for woody biomass boilers can be adopted. Those are 40 milligrams per normal cubic meter seasonal emissions. And uh, the, the best available technologies we have now for particle emission control could also be listed if this is the direction in which eco design will be going. So we are talking about either moving grade systems coupled with secondary measures for particle and matter control, or we are talking about systems that apply extreme air staging. When it comes to other pollutants, such as sulfur dioxide, HCL and dioxins and furans, I think that the results we have is that they are quite low, uh, despite the somewhat elevated sulfur and chlorine contents of agrobiomass. So the best approach there is to not adopt any emission limits in line with what already happens at Eco Design or even for larger installations using biomass at the medium combustion plant directive. We are still a little ambivalent when it comes to extending the eco design regulation up to 1000 kilowatts in principle it should be feasible because when um, we can meet emission limits at lower capacities there is no issue to do so at even bigger systems however uh, there the argument is that it seems that the market shares uh, for agrobiomass boilers at these capacity ranges are kind of small and there are also some practical difficulties in testing such systems in the lab scale. Uh, the basic difficulty, I think, is geometry. It's so usually too difficult to fit a boiler uh, in a testing stand. Uh, and then the alternative, uh, and that's something that could be discussed, is whether it makes more sense to extend the medium combustion plant directive, at least for solid biomass, downwards to capacities of 500 kilowatt, and then you would be covering everything on the EU level. 
And finally, when it comes to implementing these suggestions, I think the approach we would be following is the same one that has applied before in the eco design regulation for the woody biomass fuels. So once these revisions are, let's say, formally adopted, and as I understand from Bernardo's uh, presentation, I think we could expect something like that taking place, I think, in 2024. Uh, we would need about five years, so we're talking about 2029 or maybe 2030, before they are applicable for new boilers that enter the market. And I think that's uh, all from my side, but I think it would be good to discuss these points and others during the roundtable discussion. Yes, thank you, Manonis. Thanks for bringing up uh, a few ideas, not just from the recommendations of the project, but also for our discussion now. I will now uh, ask all the panelists to turn on their camera uh, as we are getting into the expert discussion of today's event. And maybe if we move to the next slide, we can uh, see exactly, thank you so much. Um, I will uh, introduce very shortly, uh, I will call each expert to take the floor to introduce actually him or herself. And then I think we can dig into the questions. I think there are still a couple of questions in the Q&A box for Bernardo. But first, I would like to give the floor to Thomas. Thomas, you're the CEO at Linka, which is a Danish company. Indeed, we were mentioning it before. Uh, you've been active in the, um, in the field for several years with uh, also previous experience in renewables, in wind power in particular. So please, Thomas, can you introduce shortly yourself? Tell us a bit more about Linka and why agricultural biomass or non woody biomass is relevant for you. The absolutely, floor. absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the good insights into, into the whole work on the eco design. I think it's very, very enlightening. Um, my name is Thomas Gabo. I'm the CEO of Linker Group. And we have uh, yeah, around 100 employees in Denmark and Sweden. And we produce boiler systems for biomass uh, from 250 kV up to 30 megawatt. For different kinds of applications, but uh, primarily for agro biomass and wood biomass uh, uh, systems, district heating, agro, and industry process uh, um, uses. Uh, myself, I come from uh, a background in, in wind industry, as, as Irene is uh, correctly saying. I've been working with uh, biomass for uh, four and a half years now as CEO of, of Linka. And it's been, been quite a, a, a challenging way to, to understand the whole regulations, to be honest. I, I have a legal background, but, but still it's, it's a very challenging to understand what is the, actually the regulation when you move between the countries uh, that, that are, uh, we are active in, because it, it differs a lot uh, between the individual countries. Obviously, the eco design regulations and the MCP uh, directives are setting some minimum standards, but often we are meeting some higher uh, standards or higher requirements in the individual countries and even higher requirements in, uh, let's say, environmental approval uh, requirements for the individual company. So, yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to discussing more in detail. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for indeed for introducing your work and uh, really looking forward your perspective on the well, not that just the Danish um, case and experience, but also the Scandinavian a bit uh, in a broader term. I will get back to you with a question shortly, but please, uh, first, I would like to finish our tour de table, sort of. And I will ask uh, um, John, uh, you come from a bit of a different perspective. You're a chemical engineer uh, based in Spain. So maybe you can tell us a bit more about the Musa and uh, your experience in uh, indeed process for thermochemical process for biomass. Okay, uh, thank you, Irene. Uh, as you have said, my name is John McIvar, and I work in the R&D department of the Musa Technique. The company is located in the Basque country, north of Spain, and currently we are almost 300, 300 employees, including 25 R&D staff. Traditionally, the Musa has been a domestic gas and oil boiler manufacturer, and in 20, 2012, we started manufacturing biomass boilers. Last year, biomass boilers are becoming our main business product and we are focusing our efforts on new developments in this area. Our range of pellet boilers is available from 12 to 300 kilowatts. And for us, the main sales markets are Spain, Portugal, France, and Italy. 
The main features of our boilers are the high efficiency, low emissions, automatic cleaning system for of the burner and the heat exchanger, intelligent combustion control, and the cloud connectivity. In addition, some of the boilers are multi-fuel and they are able to burn apart from wood pellets, olive stones, and hazelnut shells. So we have some experience with agrobiomass. Finally, I would like to thank the members of the project AgroBioFit and Bioenergy Europe to offer us this opportunity to share our experience and our ideas. Thank you. Thank you, John, and we're really happy to have you and your experience in this, uh, looking at southern European countries and markets and the different, different type of fuels that are used there. I will now have ask Elizabeth to take the floor. Elizabeth, you're managing director at the Austrian Heating Association. So I'm, I'm pretty sure you will also have quite some inputs to bring to the discussion. But can you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, today I'm located in Germany and we're expecting a, a huge thunderstorm here. So I hope the connection will work, uh, work very well. Um, my name is Elisabeth Berger. I'm representing the Austrian heating industry organization. Uh, we have uh, most of uh, a lot of very important and, and innovative biomass boilers manufacturer in our association, as well as manufacturers for uh, heat panels, gas and oil boilers. We have everything, but I think we have a long experience and I have the honor to accompany the development of the existing ERP regulations, so I have a long experience like this and I'm looking forward to make it even better and uh, thank for all the um, uh, presentations for today, it was very, um, I just can agree. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. And indeed, it's great to have your experience considering you're representing the full heating spectrum. And even though you have an expertise on bioenergy, of course. So, really happy to have you there as well. Uh, I will go back to our actually first speaker. So, Bernardo, I see there are a couple of questions left from you, I think, still from your presentation. So, perhaps I will start from there. And in particular, I'm looking at the second question, which is uh, asking about the comparison uh, for a label between heat pumps, which are using electricity, which today is even more expensive than what it used to be, and stoves or local uh, space heaters, which are using biomass. So considering electricity and fuels are different choices, how can these two compare? Well, do you think it's a fair comparison? Yeah. Well, that's that's a very difficult question to answer <laughs> right now. It's very specific, and I'm very sorry, but uh, yes, uh, I think we need some background to be able to uh, to reply to such a specific question. In principle, in the legislation, we try to to take everything into account uh, so that we have a fair comparison in terms of primary energy. Mm -hmm. uh, so this may be taken into account. Would, uh, I cannot really tell you right now it's, it's in, which, in which way. But when we, when we uh, carry out impact assessments, we indeed look at the uh, issues related to renewability of the energy sources. Uh, we look at the impact in greenhouse gas emissions, not only of the final energy, but also the primary energy. So all this will have to be taken into account for sure in the study. Uh, however, what, what I cannot really tell right now is uh, a way or a possible way in which this aspect may be regulated or, or not. Mm -hmm. But okay, let's, let's be a little bit patient. Uh, let's uh, wait for the evaluation and, and let's, let's see what comes up from, from the review of the legislation. And, and we'll see what what approach we can take. No, absolutely. I think this was more of a reflection point as an input for your future work. And uh, I mean, I don't think anybody has an answer for that at this stage. But another point which is connected to that and came in another question is indeed about the uh, to considering not just emissions on site, let's say, because especially if we look at heat pumps, they do not produce any emission on site, but look rather at the life cycle approach. So uh, how the energy mix is based on and uh, to consider emission throughout the full life cycle. So is this something that you might take into consideration for the revision or might be interesting also for you to- Yes, yeah, well, uh, when we talk, yes, about, pro for instance, circular economy issues is something that I, as I already told, we are looking at it. And so uh, 
we, we, we take everything into account from 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 the beginning to the end. We, we take into account all aspects related to the to the life cycle of uh, the device, and and we try to integrate that into the legislation. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, the depth, uh, if, even if we if we analyze it, the depth to which uh, uh, or the extent to which we can incorporate these issues in the legislation so far is probably not very large. And so it's it's something that is uh, little by little being uh, introduced, being taken into account in our legislation, but probably we are not there uh, to achieve you know, full legal coverage of all the aspects involved. So uh, we are working on it. Thank you, Bernardo, for giving us your, your view on this, as this is still very much in the process, uh, of course. Uh, maybe moving from an European perspective to a more Nordic perspective, uh, Thomas, I would like to get back to you and uh, looking a bit at your experience indeed in uh, what has been done, not just in Denmark, but more in general in Scandinavian country about regulating emission and how efficiency also has a role in, uh, in particular, if we look at straw fired boilers. Can you tell us a bit more about your personal uh, experience and knowledge? I can I can tell you that that for for the smaller boilers that uh, we're talking about here up to one megawatt uh, until recently in Denmark there's been an exemption for for emitting of uh, of dust uh, to to the environment and that has been it's been an exemption for for the regulation because the, the normal requirement is is uh, equivalent to to EN 303-5 uh, which says 40 milligrams uh, but straw fire facilities has been exempted until 1st of January 2022. Now it's not exempted anymore. Um, and uh, now all, all the straw fire facilities uh, up to one megawatt still uh, in Denmark, which are newly built, needs to have a, a filtering system or need to adhere to, to these regulations. I would say that the, the, the most use of, of, of agrobiomass uh, in Scandinavia has been uh, been in Denmark. Uh, there's been slight use of that in southern part of, of Sweden as well, uh, particularly in in uh, terms of, of straw as uh, as a medium. A uh, bit on on the pellets as well. Uh, that's been used in in different areas. Um, but I would say it's 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 not it's not a big concern uh, whether you use the one standard or the other, as long as we are on uh, mutual levels on on this. Uh, we have already uh, always used uh, the EN 303-5 standard and then local regulations in, in Denmark that are adhering to this standard as, uh, as the, the regulation for, for the smaller boilers. And then living side by side with the eco design regulation up to 500 kilowatt boilers uh, for, for woody uh, biomass. Uh, in general, it's been the same regulation in, in Denmark for any kind of use of, of, of uh, biomass that you put into the boiler, uh, uh, it's the same regulation. Then there is this exemption of, of, of the straw that has been, uh, been exempted in, in rural areas uh, for, for, yeah, some, to be honest, some, some uh, concerns that uh, this would be a hard requirement to meet for, for a lot of farmers uh, that, that is used straw for a lot of years. Uh, instead of using oil boilers or gas boilers in, in the rural areas. Thank you, Thomas. That's indeed a quite interesting perspective. But uh, as we've been talking about straw, because of course in Denmark mm. and uh, overall in Scandinavian country, that's the main uh, agrobiomass fuel. Uh, maybe I can move on to John and ask about some other type of fuel. So uh, considering indeed different fuel characteristic uh, which are the which should be in your opinion the emission limits for non biomass from the more the spend this time john <laughs> this is thank you this is a very important issue for us and according to our experience the emissions limits shouldn't be the same for wood pellets and agrobiomass our knowledge as you said is limited to olive stones and hazelnut and almond shells and at first, when you compare the fuel characteristics, for example, the nitrogen and ash content, best class olive stones and hazelnut shells have similar characteristics compared with wood pellets. Then what we see in combustion tests is that NOx and dust emissions are higher with this agrobiomass agro compared with wood pellets. 
In the same way that uh, Mr. Thomas Brunner has said, not only the ash concentration is related with dust emissions, but also the ash composition has an effect. And this, in this case, uh, has a negative effect. Apart from that, another important difference is the combustion behavior at partial load, at, at the minimum heat output. The emissions of uh, carbon monoxide and the OGCs, the organic gases compounds, are higher in minimum power compared with wood pellets. One common strategy is to increase the minimum power, for example, from 30% to 50%, to improve the emissions and still maintain a good seasonal performance. And maybe this strategy could be also considered in the codicin regulation. Conclusion, or, uh, from our point of view, the emission limits shouldn't be equal for good pellets and agrobiomass. And at this first stage, I suggest maintaining the same limits of the class three according to the standard 335. We have to consider that it is only the first stage for agrobiomass in the codesign regulation, and maybe in the future the limitations may be stricter. That's, that's our opinion. Thank you, John. That's uh, that's indeed a very interesting point of view, maybe a bit different from what part of the audience thinks, considering the poll we, we just had maybe. before. Maybe. <laughs> but that's uh, that's why we're having this conversation, I think, because to hear a different opinion on, on the same topic. So we'll turn on to Elizabeth now to, to see how do you believe the Austrian manufacturers see this uh, market for agriculture, agricultural biomass, non-woody biomass. Is this something interesting for them? And how do you see extension of eco-design can also impact on the fuel assortment that you might have in Austria? Uh, we in principle see this very positive because uh, Europe is lack of, of resources, of energy resources and biomass, also non-woody biomass, is one of the main important resources we already have. And this, I think we need everything uh, to, to save or to, to secure our energy supply there. Uh, there will be some challenges to introduce non-woody uh, biomass. We already have it done in the standard. The standard the 3035 uh, already knows a non-woody biomass, so that would not be a problem there. But I think it will be a problem in the in the in the practical in the practical way, because uh, as already mentioned before, we have uh, different emission values and especially. Uh, but I think we are a little bit higher. We already have a differentiation between automatic and, and manually feed boilers. So I think that should be possible to also have limits for non-woody biomass. We already have uh, different emissions for, for, for solid um, uh, fossil fuels there. So to make some much more uh, differentiation, if the commission is willing to do it, that should be handled. The problem I see more or less is the, the emission, uh, the, the efficiency uh, topic. Uh, the uh, eco-design regulation originally was made to reduce energy consumption. So in the original way, it's an efficiency rule, uh, um, efficiency regime. Uh, then that came in within the, the gas and oil boilers, the first anorexia requirement. And within the biomass or the solid fuel uh, regulation, we have a lot more of emissions. And now the, the focus more and more shifting on the emissions away from the efficiency. And so I think we should go back to the efficiency topic. And uh, with uh, talking about the efficiency, it's especially a problem for smaller boilers uh, with the auxiliary um, energy consumption. Because especially if you have an ESP or you need an ESP to fulfill some emission uh, requirements, you have additional auxiliary energy and then you get in trouble uh, with the um, efficiency requirements. And so we should be very careful and put all these things together to have at the end of the day, not best available um, uh, values. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the day, we need best available boilers, real boilers to sell on the market. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you also for reminding us that indeed, I think now even more than ever, we do need all available resources. And if we look at agricultural biomass in particular, there is quite some on top potential uh, still on the ground, so we can do more for that. And maybe a question connecting to this is, 
indeed, if the local air emission regulations are challenging in this context, so it's difficult to work with those sort of regulation. I don't know if Elizabeth, you want to take this or if we can also ask maybe Thomas to, to take, uh, take the floor here. I think we both have a lot of experience in it. <laughs> uh, That's uh, why I'm asking. <laughs> it's, it's very funny. On the, one, on the one side, we put a lot of work to make uh, European or regulations for the whole uh, uh, market, for the whole European market. And on the other hand, uh, to bring products into the market. And on the other hand, the, uh, uh, the different nations have, or the member states have a lot of fun to make regulations where we are allowed to operate our products. The one example was in Denmark where they are uh, allowed to operate the product with higher emission values. On the other hand, we have Germany who uh, allows just to operate uh, EU conform or EAP conform uh, solid fuel boilers with lower emissions. And it, I think it would be a good idea to, to, uh, to make it clear, to find one way, because it doesn't help us that we have two different regulations. We have still the, uh, the uh, European Union uh, regulations, and on the other hand, we still have the nation, uh, the, the member states who have different uh, emission uh, requirements for operating them. And on the third, the third part, and I think also it's a very important part, uh, subsidies because boilers cost a lot of money uh, and uh, the, uh, the subsidiaries in the different countries uh, have the third regime. And so we still have a confusion and it makes no sense to make one, one more <laughs> regime after the other. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thomas, maybe you want to comment as well? I, 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 would, I would say that, that it, it's, for me, it's very difficult to compare a 20 kilowatt boiler to a 500 kilowatt boiler. To be honest, you know, it, 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 and, I, and I appreciate the, the, all the work that, that uh, Thomas Bona has, has been doing on, on the, the pellet boilers. But, but what we see is that a lot of our customers at least want to use uh, straw or miscanthus or whatever, uh, not in pelletized form, but, but in the raw form. So, so, so it's shredded. So, so the, the, uh, the fuel uh, acts differently when it comes into the boiler, right? And now you have a, a, a boiler system and an eco design system, which is, to be honest, based on uh, assessment on uh, the efficiency towards a consumer. But here you're talking about a boiler system, which is not for a consumer. It is for uh, industrial purposes or commercial purposes or just heating even. So, so it is a different kind of, of way of, of, of approaching uh, the whole market and, 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 and understanding that uh, selling to a consumer is one thing, you need to have a labeling and, and I think that's fine, but this is not a dishwasher that you're selling when you're up in selling a 500 kilowatt uh, boiler system. And then we are also talking about implementing this to larger boilers, even up to one megawatt boiler systems, right? And then we are certainly way, uh, off on any uh, consumer uh, in the business, right? So, so I, I, th I think it's, it's difficult to put a uniform standard down on, on one thing without considering a lot of elements in this. And I agree with Elizabeth. I think that the eco design standard should be on the efficiency rather than on the emissions of, of the boiler systems. We have a, a good example on the EN303. There's five regulations or, or standard. Why not use that as a, as a format and, and ex, uh, extend the EO, uh, the EN303-5, uh, uh, which is now limited to 500 kilowatt up to one megawatt instead, and implement that in the, 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 the eco design standard if, if that's what's, what's wanted. Then we have a uniform standard for, for, for everything, right? Up to one megawatt. And then above one megawatt, you have the MCP directive, which is quite different. Another thing that I would like really to see is that the testing is done on the same level. We've already heard about that, that today we are, we are testing on 10% on oxygen. We have regulation also in, in the emission levels that says 11%, we have 13%, we have 6%. Why don't we just set one standard for this? How, how difficult can it be? You know. Thank you, Thomas. I think I will 
go back to the other Thomas to maybe comment on these uh, two points or several points actually raised on the topic of efficiency and testing. So Thomas Brunner, <laughs> do you want to comment and take the floor on this? Uh, well, yeah, um, of course, you, you cannot compare a residential heating system uh, with a 500 kilowatt, uh, one megawatt plant. Uh, bigger plants are purpose-built, uh, they are often tailored to the demands of the single consumer. You have different fuel fitting systems which fit into the buildings uh, which are made for this uh, specific client. So the, there's a big difference between, uh, uh, let's say, serial product as we see it in uh, the residential scale combustion and uh, a bigger plant, let's say, starting at about uh, 500, 600 kilowatt. And uh, therefore, uh, I think that uh, also this uh, upper limit of the 500 kilowatt uh, for the eco design regulation is, uh, is appropriate. Uh, uh, of course, uh, well, that's a, a long lasting critics that we have to deal with uh, different uh, uh, oxygen relations regarding the emission limits uh, and sometimes it also comes to milligram per megajoule or milligram per kilogram fuel or whatever so it's uh, it's not easy it's it's uh, improving a little bit but uh, I fully agree that uh, there should be a consistency between uh, the different countries of course uh, yeah uh, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, I think it's a, it's a big difference if we are talking about uh, a big boiler system or a rather big boiler system, which usually has an operator who really takes care of the system, who can do some kind of maintenance work, or if we're talking about to a 20, 50, 100 kilowatt boiler, which is standing there in a private building or a smaller public building, uh, which really has to run without observation automatically without any problem for uh, optimally uh, the whole day over the whole year or what the, the heating time is. So uh, it's important that the systems are robust and uh, this robustness of course should also be in terms of uh, efficiencies. Uh, regarding the question of efficiency and emissions, uh, these are more or less political questions and uh, I really have no position on that because I'm uh, in R&D and in boiler development. So <laughs> that's a question for some other people in this spectrum. <laughs> yeah, maybe on the political question, we can either go back to Manolis or to Bernardo. I see in the meantime that we had some other comments in the, um, the Q&A box. So someone is suggesting that uh, we can also think about adapting emission limits based on where the boilers are installed because indeed air pollution is quite critical in certain regions uh, and less critical in others. And also another point that was raised is that uh, it might be good to separate uh, the use of agrobiomass boilers, whether in rural areas or in areas like city or uh, built up ones, where indeed the impact will be different. So maybe, I don't know if Manolis or Bernardo, you want to comment on uh, these points as well? They are not really questions, they are more remarks, let's should say. I, should I start first before giving the floor to Bernardo? Yes, and then I will go back to John again, but uh, please Manolis first. Yeah, uh, well, again, I'm not a politician, so I can only, uh, I'm also from the R&D sector. So even though we promised we would produce finally some political recommendations, um, maybe I can say a few things. I think it's uh, really important uh, what um, may several say of the panelists have highlighted that uh, we are talking about different markets. Uh, on the one hand, we have the residential consumers, and for those, eco design is supposed to be a guideline in selecting the most appropriate products when you don't really have a very uh, big uh, technical background. Uh, we also have, however, several other potential end users, which not necessarily are very big and wouldn't need a dedicated operator, for example. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, resident, uh, sorry, commercial buildings, uh, municipal buildings, uh, which often have applications which can be well below the 500 kilowatt range, and also may not yet have, um, let's say, uh, someone who is very technical 
uh, when selecting a solution. So it's also a question uh, that maybe Bernardo should, uh, let's say, try to answer if he can, uh, whether um, these are also consumers that eco design targets. So commercial sector actors, not residential ones. Um, and I would, uh, I would also like to address one comment, uh, I think that was done by Thomas, that people who would like to use biomass in a more primary uh, form, uh, unprocessed. And uh, indeed, in this project, the wheat straw we tested was in pelletized form. It was a little I say, easier for the procurement purposes, but the miscanthus we tested, which is well, not totally similar, but you know, it looks a bit the same. Uh, uh, was in a chip form, so it was quite uh, close to what uh, you know a farmer might use in his own uh, system. And again, there I think we could uh, demonstrate that uh, you can go uh, very low uh, with emissions at least with the proper measures. Thank you, Manolis. I don't know if. Bernardo, maybe you want also to make a comment on what has just been discussed? Well, yes, I, I can comment that in principle, uh, as far as I, I know, the co-design legislation in general doesn't really uh, exclude um, industrial uses. So this, this is not uh, by itself excluded. So I understand that there is um, a focus on specific devices, which are or specific powers, which are the ones that are considered at the time in which the legislation has been drafted that brought more uh, issues from the point of, of energy efficiency, from the point of view of pollutant emissions than others. And the legislation is focusing on, on those aspects which would correspond in principle to the low hanging fruits. And that doesn't mean that uh, the scope of the legislation cannot be extended to devices with uh, higher powers. And actually, this probably is one of the main issues that we need to consider uh, in the revision of the legislation. Uh, as I said before, the outcome is not certain. So uh, we, can, we, can, we can evaluate it, we can, we can see how it looks like, um, but uh, yeah, we will see if, uh, if it's possible to extend the legislation to, to, higher, to higher powers or, or not. Then there was another issue about different limits, I think, for for urban and rural areas, which uh, has also been asked, uh, the co-design legislation in principle doesn't doesn't fix this. And so, the, the co-design legislation sets limits um, to the products, uh, energy efficiency limits to the products. In this case, also pollutant emission limits, but um, it doesn't really come into the the considerations if. Uh, uh, a device is used in, in a rural environment or an, an urban environment. What, because actually this is not in the scope of the of the legislation. What uh, and, and we we had been discussing also about the competences of member states and about different regulations. Probably you know better than I. It's it's probably something messy. Eh, that I, I don't. I'm not saying that the situation is ideal. But there is a, a clear split of. I don't, sometimes it's not so clear, but there is there is a split of competences between uh, the European Union and, and national authorities. And for instance, national authorities uh, can ban specific products in in urban areas if they see that there are uh, some problems related to to pollutant emissions. And so this is not against the legislation what they cannot do is to ban a product on the basis of par a parameter which is regulated in the co-design uh, legislation. So there, the, if the, on the parameters that are regulated by uh, the co-design legislation, the European Union legislation prevails. For instance, if the, the European co-design legislation of one specific product sets a, a minimum energy efficiency level, uh, um, a national or, or local uh, or regional um, legislation cannot come up with a lower limit. That's not possible, but it's been the case and, and actually they, they can do it. They could ban a specific uh, product on the basis of the, of the fuel used that they can do because that's uh, the, the, the co-design rules and are not 
uh, regulating the fuel as a parameter. So this is a complicated issue that also brings to us a lot of problems. We need to, to, to answer too many questions, um, but uh, more or less the, the situation is, is like that. And, and the, the co-design legislation doesn't really get into the, the use or the, the environment in which a specific product is, is used. Thank you, Bernardo, for the, this punctualization. And indeed, it's true that uh, member states can decide to go about what was decided in the design based on local circ circumstances. Uh, Manolis, you want to react to this? I see you raised your hand. And then I will go back to John. And then I see there is another question in the Q&A box. Yeah, just to complement where exactly what Bernardo was saying, that uh, it's not really, I think, up to Eco Design to uh, decide on whether such appliances can be used in the rural or the urban uh, setting. Uh, and we have already, I think, now several examples of uh, appliances, not necessarily biomass ones, which are banned on a national level uh, with the climate laws that are being adopted by several member states, for example. Uh, Greece actually is, has just um, put into the is putting on the parliament a climate law that will ban uh, oil boilers from uh, in around five years or so, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and these products are still going to be in the eco design, but it won't be possible to buy a new one in the market just to you know uh, maintain your existing one. Just that. Thanks. Thank you, Manalis. And it's, uh, it's good also to know that there are these sort of initiatives promoting more efficient and sustainable options, even though, uh, I mean, and it's nice to see how the national legislation is also a front runner of European ones. So the two things goes hand in hand. But before, uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned uh, the point of cost. So I would like to go indeed back to John and ask you if the cost for demonstrating eco design compliance for especially for new fuels. Arab barrier, and especially if the market is small, can you maybe comment on this and give us your opinion on this subject? Yes, uh, for sure. Uh, this is an interesting question, Irene. Testing each boiler or for each agro biomass means an effort from the manufacturer point of view. And for sure, if the market of a specified agro biomass is small, it's probable that it is not going to be interesting for a boiler manufacturer. So finally, it can become a, a barrier. I think that simplifying the test requirements should be considered. An option to reduce the effort would be testing the agro biomass only at nominal power and avoid minimum power test. Or another option could be group together agro biomass with similar fuel characteristics. And in this way, testing one of each group could be enough. If we want to promote the use of different agro biomass. That is why we are here. The standardization of very small niches or markets shouldn't have a great cost for the manufacturers. Otherwise, it could become a real limitation. That's that's our view. Well, thank you, John. I see Thomas wants to reply, I guess, since he raised his hand. So, Thomas? Yeah, it, it was just a remark to, to John about this comparable fuel uh, testing, because that, that has been accepted under 303-5 standards in, in Denmark, at least. Uh, if you're if you're testing on corn, you have the same testing on straw, uh, etc. So so and grain residues. So you have comparable fuels that uh, that should have the same uh, or equivalent uh, emission levels uh, if you use it in in the boiler system. And obviously, if that could be adapted again, uh, it's the 303-5 standard that that's been used for for this testing. And and if that could be adapted under the Eco design that would be a great help. Thank you, Thomas, for bringing your perspective here. I will stay a bit longer with you because I see there is a question that popped up in the chat. A question from Canada. So we are quite international today. It's, uh, it's good to see this is of interest of so many people in different parts of the world. So the question is if there has been any interest in combustion of corn, corn residues, uh, both in stove or stalks. In the EU, and because this interest is quite high in North America, but the chlorine content is always uh, a little bit what's uh, <laughs> ruining the situation. So, any development or any comment on this? And I don't know if maybe also the other Thomas then wants to comment on this, but please. <laughs> well, the, there has been a lot of uh, R and D work with this kind of fuels, and they usually show a little bit of problematic combustion behavior. 
uh, of course, I think there's interest in, in burning uh, everything that brings energy, but uh, the, the first thing I think uh, to make it interesting for industry is that there is a fuel market. Because you, you need the fuel market, you need the widespread availability of the fuels that it makes sense to develop a, a combustion device uh, which is capable for burning these fuels. And uh, that's uh, maybe uh, one issue at the moment why this is not uh, so interesting for European boiler manufacturers at the moment, uh, because uh, the focus is more on, on other fuels. I think it's always uh, uh, the same as uh, with the issue mentioned before, uh, with testing different categories of uh, agrobiomass fuels. Uh, it's important that uh, there's also a market development to have uh, availability of different uh, agrobiomass fuels and to develop some kind of quality criteria for these fuels, some kind of quality labels so that you really also better know what you get as a fuel if you buy, for instance, uh, pruning pellets or something like that. So that uh, also has to go hand in hand with uh, the other efforts uh, which are done to bring these fuels more in the market. Thank you, Thomas. I don't know if someone else want to comment on this, uh, on this point as well. Maybe, maybe just a yep. comment from my side. Uh, we, we've tested a lot of different kinds of biomass uh, fuels and uh, uh, coming out of, of using straw as a fuel and, and uh, it, it's, um, at least for me, it's difficult to see that you cannot uh, build a boiler uh, almost for any kind of, of, of biomass. If you could get it into the boiler room, you can build a boiler uh, for these requirements. Uh, based on, on the combustion technology and, and, and so forth. So if it's corn stalks or corn residues, uh, grain residues or whatever, uh, it can be used as a, as a fuel. Well, that's uh, very good to, to hear and uh, very positive also for future development of uh, alternative fuels, let's say. Uh, since we've been talking about both eco-design, but also while the medium combustion plan, the MCP directive was mentioned several times, uh, an open question to all the speakers, and in the meantime, if any other questions want to pop in in the chat, I mean, don't be shy, we have still <laughs> quite some things to discuss. My question is, if you think there is quite a significant market interest in those installations which, between uh, 500 and uh, 1000, so 1 megawatt of size, so would the extension of eco-designs to this capacity range make sense, or would it more on the MCP size to get uh, lower to, let's say, the 500 kilowatts? Does anybody wants to answer this? It's quite an open, <laughs> an open question mark. Elizabeth? Yes, I, I will, will answer this. I see it really problematic as the other ones to put uh, five kilowatt boilers together with one megawatt boilers in one regime. It up to now, no one in the whole industry, uh, independent of the fuel, biomass or not, understand why we should include boilers from 500 or 400 kilowatts as in other lots up to one megawatt. This boil, the small boilers are normally made for consumers. They need to be standards. There are a lot of boilers that make sense here. Yeah? And especially they have um, a seasonal efficiency. That means uh, we tested them with part and full load. Full load. If you have a boiler up from five megawatt, uh, five kilowatt, sometimes uh, lower than they're normally tailor-made. They never operate with part load. They just operate with full load or other things. Yeah? They are really special boilers. It, uh, it's really not to understand why they are not um, part of the medium combustion plant on the one hand. And the second thing I up to now do not understand. Normally, the smaller a boiler, the smaller compliance, the higher the emission values are allowed. In the biomass sector, it's the opposite. The biomass boilers, the small boilers have much stricter emissions than the medium combustion plants, which really need a lot of, of, of fuel. And so um, that's two points, I think, if we uh, make a new regulation, we have to think about, but to extend it to one megawatt makes really no sense at all. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. That's a clear <laughs> point of view. I don't know if any other speaker want to comment on this or react also to what Elizabeth just said. Thomas, please, the floor is yours. I totally agree. <laughs> Does any speaker disagree? That's my, my question. <laughs> I don't think so. I think we are quite all aligned on, the, on this point. But uh, maybe um, as we are going towards the final part of our... Ah, Manolis, please, do you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to comment something from what I understand. Uh, I, I think that there was not even a unanimous agreement in extending the EN uh, 3035 standard up to one megawatt. So without a testing standard, then it's very difficult to build a regulation uh, for this type of boilers, I mean the eco design regulation. For me, it makes much more sense to extend MCP down to 500 kilowatts, and then uh, you have at least uh, a sketch of a European common background, let's say, because a directive can be implemented in different ways in national legislation. Uh, so still, it doesn't make the job very easy for boiler manufacturers, I'm afraid. Uh, but it would be much better for me, obviously. I totally agree. I think with both Elizabeth and Thomas on that regard. So maybe we can be a little more clear on our recommendations, at least on this sector. The... Thank you, Manolis. Uh, um, and thanks indeed to Elizabeth and Thomas for commenting on this and bringing their point of view. Um, I don't know if any other over speaker want to intervene on this. Otherwise, I will maybe ask a question to our audience with the last and final poll for today's event. And it's a difficult question, but how do you see the future of agrobiomass in Europe? And then I will, once we will collect the question from the audience, I will also ask this very same question to our panelists to give them the opportunity to elaborate a bit more on that. So I see our audience is a bit hesitant on this question. Uh, the previous polls got uh, several inputs Immediately this time, I think everybody's thinking about it a bit longer. Maybe they have to read the, the answers more thoroughly. Yes. Before they... So well, the the answers are it will significantly grow in in the heating sector. So we will mostly use for heating sectors. It will increase, but uh, only play a minor, like a marginal role, let's say, in the heating sector. The mobilization of the sector will increase, but for other uses, let's say, either in the energy or non-energy related field. Or the last option is that agrobiomass will not increase at all. So, but I see so far nobody is addressing the last option. So, I think we all agree the sector will increase, but that will leave a little bit more of time to to our attendees and participants to to provide their views on this. It's also a really tough question, Irene. It is, but uh, it's interesting to see. Our worst speakers will handle this, yeah. <laughs> Thomas. So maybe I I can start with you afterwards if you want. <laughs> okay, I would say we can wait another five seconds and then we will close the poll. So you can cast your vote now. And here are the results. So I think it's clear that well, as I was saying before, nobody said agrobiomass will not increase, which is quite positive. Uh, the majority of the participants think this will be for uses in the heating sector. And uh, we have a little bit of a mixed opinion on mobilization for other energy or non-energy related sector. So, um, Thomas, do you want to comment on the result or maybe you want to tell us? Uh, um, I, I see that some people are commenting that indeed more than one answer was relevant. So I, I agree this is not black and white. It's more nuanced. but. Maybe we can do a, a short tour the, of opinions on, on this question. Well, if, if, if I should start, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy if it should uh, increase as, uh, in, in uses, both in heating sectors, but also in a lot of uh, commercial and process sectors uh, could be relevant uh, for, for, for agrobiomass. I, I think there's huge potentials um, in the market for for using of of agrobiomass and 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 uh, we need to do something about uh, the reliance on gas and, and oil uh, still we need to take that down and, and agrobiomass is is just outside the window so uh, why not use it absolutely cannot uh, cannot agree more with what you said 
John, maybe you also want to answer this question. How do you see the future of uh, agrobiomass in Europe? Yes. Yeah, I think that there is a lot, uh, a lot to do from starting from us, from manufacturers, also from producers, and also from the lawyers or from the uh, from the standard. And I hope that uh, the consumption of the agrobiomass agro will increase significantly. But it should. And I hope also that the regulations also will help to do that. And that's, that's my opinion. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that policies, both at European and national level, will be crucial in uh, helping overcoming the barriers that the sector is uh, facing, the mobilization issues that are still quite present, but also in promoting best practices and provide support, as we said before, through subsidies, uh, support scheme and programs and awareness raising in general, because again, I think there is still a lot to do on the educational side, if you want, on the agrobiomass. But maybe, I don't know if uh, Elizabeth or Bernardo wants to uh, answer also this question, address what do they expect for the future of the agrobiomass sector? Elizabeth, maybe you want to go first? Um, I think that there is a, a role for agrobiomass because we need, as I mentioned in my first statement, every kind of energy we are able to, to get in, in Europe. And that's not so many, as you know. Um, if that will be uh, agrobiomass will be all in the heating sector, also some in the biogas sector, I'm not, not sure at the moment. The last time when we saw a huge uh, increase of using agrobiomass in the heating sector, that was a situation when gas was expensive and we have too much corn in the market. The situation now is completely different, uh, but I think it will increase, especially in the markets where you have olive stones and, and things like that and, and less wood. Um, we'll see. I'm, I look forward to see the opinion from uh, hear the opinion from Bernardo. <laughs> well, Bernardo, then uh, well, yours. <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid that I'm going to disappoint you a little bit because I mean th this is a forecast, and I, I don't have uh, enough elements to uh, to reply to the question about this. Uh, again, probably the the revision that we do about the the co-design and energy labeling will be able to. You know, once once that we know it and once that it's actually applicable, it will it will it will probably it may direct uh, the market in one direction or or another. However, we we try to do the legislation also as 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 much neutral as possible. Sometimes it's not it's not really possible or completely possible, but we try just to you know, to take care that uh, the level of emissions is acceptable that the, the energy efficiency is also acceptable and then what comes out later uh, following the legislation is something that we cannot really fully control and that uh, i'm now not able to tell you if the market is going in this in the other direction i think that's an insight probably that the stakeholders have that uh, people working in, in 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 companies in the sector itself no, I think way better than I because they are hearing opinions. They they are in co in contact with the reality of the sector. So in this case, I think I would I would really rely way more on what the the, the stakeholders uh, feel about this issue. And Bernardo, staying with you, then uh, because you said you don't have enough like information, let's say or anyway, it's a for uh, like a provision of future. If you could choose. Uh, if you have like some sort of magic wand, what would you ask for in this context about uh, the agrobiomass development? Well, um, I would actually, uh, I'm, I'm probably linking with the with the presentation, very interesting presentation about the test. If I would like to wish something, I would like uh, that uh, a, a boiler could deal with uh, woody biomass as well as with non-woody biomass, and which uh, I think as we have seen from the, the results, this is not the case. So probably this is the future I would like, you know, that uh, we have uh, versatile boilers that can uh, really cope with a wide variety of, 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 of fuels uh, without it really having a repercussion in the, or an impact in the, in the environment. So this is what I would like. I don't know if it will be possible, but probably we should push in that, in that direction. 
I think Thomas might want to disagree with you or want to comment. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to, to comment on that. Uh, maybe the, uh, the, the kind of the diagrams, the arrangement in the diagrams was a little bit confusing, but uh, if you look into them in detail, then the, you will see that there have been two boilers uh, which were able to, to keep all the emission limits also with the agricultural fuels and they have initially been designed for wood fuels even if one of them is also designed for some uh, specific agricultural fuels so uh, it's in fact it's it's possible uh, of course, uh, you you have to keep the assortments uh, in a in a way. There, there are some uh, assortments which are, are not made for combustion purposes. If chlorine is too high, if it potassium is unrealistically high, then it makes no sense. But uh, at the moment, we already have these technologies. Uh, also, many of the other boilers were able to at least at full load uh, burn the agrobiomass at rather low emissions. Uh, John already said that there are some problems with partial load uh, going down to 30%, but uh, I think it's possible to overcome these uh, problems in, in general. And uh, just look at boiler one and boiler two in, uh, in the list and you will see that uh, they already made this. Well, that's precisely my wish. So I'm very, I'm very happy to uh, to hear that this is possible eh? and that, uh, yeah, okay, well, we probably is the, the way ahead. But uh, I, I've just been asking by my wish, so this is this is actually what I what I would wish. Uh, good news is your wish is already reality or getting there. So I think that's a very, very positive for the future. Uh, I would like to have a one last round of uh, question or opinion from our speaker. So we'll turn to John again. And uh, John, my question for you, for your final remarks, let's say before closing our final session, is uh, do you think that extending the eco design regulation to olive stones would provide a competitive advantage for the Musa or for other manufacturers? Thank you, Irene. I, I believe that uh, extending eco design regulation to non woody biomass, such as olive stones, like you say, will provide an advantage to the manufacturers and especially to users. The regulation will ensure that all boilers that will be put into the market are environmentally friendly and users, apart from judging its advantages, such as efficiency or economic savings, they will be also sure that they are minimizing the emissions of pollutants. But regulation, in my opinion, must consider that the emissions required for non woody biomass should be reachable without filters or any other high investment equipment, equipment like electrostatic pre precipitators. Because otherwise, it, would, it will become a real barrier for the market, at least for a lot of cost, customers. And that's that's my, my opinion about that. Thank you, John. I think indeed uh, we need to have clear targets and higher ambition, but this should be also workable and uh, should not come uh, with too expensive systems, but rather aff be affordable for most of the people. Maybe yes. I can ask uh, Thomas if uh, this also applies to Dinka. So what's your opinion as a... Uh, I, not for olive stones, but always speaking about non woody biomass, uh, let's say, boilers. Well, we, we've been working with uh, uh, agrobiomass for more than 40 years. So uh, obviously, uh, we would like to, to use that experience also in, in a lot of other uh, areas. We are, we are seeing uh, it broadening now. We are seeing a lot of interest. Uh, obviously, uh, the whole situation in, in, uh, in Ukraine is... is is assisting people need to get away from gas people need to get away from from oil and and uh, it's really pushing the the referendum here in 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 in, in the way of of pushing towards more agrobiomass and and i appreciate that there is a, a competition with biogas facilities and, and things like that on on the biomass side uh, but i still see a lot of uh, potential in in certain areas and and uh, and uh, mostly geographical areas where you have a lot of uh, agro uh, um, being uh, being used today. So, so uh, obviously you need to go to the sources and you need to go to the countries where the sources are. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for bringing your experience uh, as, I mean, your personal experience, but also Linka's experience in, the, in this field. 
Elizabeth, back to you. Uh, one final remarks, one final statement. Do the floor is yours. Uh, you want to comment on this or maybe on something else that was already mentioned during our roundtable discussion? Thank you very much. And thank you all for your attention. I think um, we always, if, uh, during the revision discussion, we will all looking forward to have, uh, it's uh, necessary to know that technically everything is possible. The problem all, also is to focus on the costs of it. So if you really want to develop the biomass boiler market more, then I think we should make clear that we need realistic values, realistic values for the efficiency and uh, for the emissions. Uh, for agrobiomass as well as the uh, woody biomass boilers, and that it's necessary to know that the NOx content is always related, as Thomas Brunner showed very well, to the fuel. And that's the, the main difference to gas boilers. The gas boilers NOx is always uh, coming out from the, from the burning process, from the air, and the N NOx context from biomass is always coming from the product. And if we keep this in mind, I think we will all have to get a great future and we see a lot of potential in it. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And it's nice to conclude saying that uh, everything is possible, technically speaking, but we do need the right uh, support and policy incentives or other than the cost ones for sure. So if there is no other final words from our speaker. I would uh, thank you all again warmly. It was a very interesting discussion. And I will give the floor to Manolis, the project coordinator, to wrap up such an interesting session and to, to make some uh, final uh, summary, let's say. Manolis, please. Well, I think it has been a great uh, discussion. It was uh, interesting to see uh, that many people now see a brighter future for uh, agrobiomass. Uh, being the coordinator of the project, uh, sometimes I think I have to explain why we are looking for this technological pathway and not others that are under discussion, like why are we not producing biogas or uh, transport fuels or even chemicals or commodities with uh, agrobiomass. Well, when it comes to biogas, I think the answer is fairly simple. There is often an technological incompatibility of the feedstocks. We are talking about things that are not easily degradable. So that goes uh, out of the window. But regarding the other components, I think uh, a key differentiation uh, has to do with the size of the value chain. When we're talking about agrobiomass heating, often we are talking about small scale installations. Well, if you take uh, eco design as a guideline, you go up to 500 kilowatts and the amount of fuel you need is not that big. Uh, it may still be challenging if you do something from scratch on the local level, but uh, it's generally doable. And in rural Europe, there are many, many locations, many applications where you could install such boilers using agricultural residues, using forest residues or other local assortments. And you could still phase out uh, fossil fuels. Uh, mostly it would be uh, uh, petroleum products uh, rather than gas because gas may not go in that area uh, but still uh, you can have an important contribution to rural decarbonization uh, so that is why we're talking about agrobiomass uh, heating because it still makes sense uh, from a bottom-up approach i would say not a top-down approach uh, in any case, I think we will take uh, all the comments into consideration. I think we have already seen some, let's say, very meaningful inputs in how to fine tune our final, let's say, recommendations. The ones we'll be passing on both to CINEA, our funding agency, as well as to Bernardo and the eco design team in the European Commission. Uh, of course, uh, I think we will be sharing the workshop materials um, in the coming days. Uh, since uh, the project finishes by the end of June, uh, it would be good if you have some more explicit comments to send them to me and Irene in writing in a short email uh, with some justifications. And uh, since it seems that uh, the development of the agrobiomass sector in whatever, let's say, technological pathway has to necessarily go not only through the technology but through policy, I think it's a very good op opportunity to remind you again about our final event in Brussels, uh, our hybrid uh, event. So you can still attend it if you're from home, uh, but you're more than welcome to join us in Brussels if you can do that. Uh, where we will have the chance also to dig a bit deeper uh, into 
real cases of how agrobiomass can be deployed in the real framework based on what we have been doing in the project and also to um, let's say further promote the discussion about what should be done on the political uh, level um, and i will close just by mentioning uh, repower eu since it is a very recent development only yesterday did we have the the final i think uh, communication from the european commission on it it's positive that uh, bioenergy is explicitly acknowledged as being a very large contributor to renewable energy it is also positive that uh, agricultural residues along with forest residues and other underexploited uh, resources are mentioned as things that can contribute to the europeans um car fossil free carbon future it, what is not so positive is the fact that we don't see a lot of concrete measures on how to make uh, this potential exploitable so i think we still have a lot of work to do on that front uh, and i will uh, stop at here thank you all for your attention both the panelists uh, for their contributions and the audience for the questions and their uh, patience so far Thank you so much, Manolis. Thanks also for this final remark from the Power EU and the fact that indeed we will need more than just a mention for the bioenergy sector, but trader targets and concrete measures, as you said. But uh, I am positive that uh, we will get there both for woody and agricultural biomass, so woody and non woody bi biomass. But thank you again to all of you for participating today. Um, as Renali said, if you want to comment on the um, results of the project or you want to uh, reach out, here are our contact details, including the website of the project. And uh, again, the slides will be shared for your knowledge in the next few days. And uh, join us for the final event on 2nd of June. If you come to Brussels, let us know. Otherwise, see you online. Have a very nice day. Bye bye.